Amen. And I know today, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, I need the Lord, and I'm very grateful for all the wonderful things that God has done for me. Can I just say thanks for coming to church today? We were riding up the road, um, and we were praising God for the rain. And, uh, you know, in some churches, today would be a great day to, to, to sleep in. How many of y'all like sleeping in on a rainy day? Amen. Um, can I confess that's me too? But um, woke up at 5 o'clock, and the windows were open, and you could hear the rain. And uh, Lynn looked at me, and um, we were sitting there, and, and, and I said, uh, she said, it sure is nice to just lay in bed and hear the rain. And I'm like, amen, amen. And there may be some on the camera that are laying in, that are, are sleeping in bed, and, or maybe not asleep, maybe they're just laying in bed and watching us. So I pray y'all get a blessing too, amen. Y'all say amen to them. Amen. But thanks for coming or tuning in. Last week, um, we had some guests, and uh, they made a comment to someone that said that the pastor had to know, uh, somebody had, had to talk to them because I was preaching about them. How many of y'all know I wasn't preaching at them? I was just preaching God's word, and it hit them. Amen? And if they're watching online, I'll hit them again because it has nothing to do with me. <laughs> I am grateful that uh, what God does, he does well, and he can even use somebody like me. If you have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 4. Now, we're going to cover the last few verses of chapter 4, and we're continuing our theme called the church triumphant. God's church is triumphant. It works wonderfully well. It's worked for uh, millenniums, millenniums. Uh, there, there is ups and downs in the economy. There's ups and downs in governments. Things come and things go, but our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He lasts, he's well, he's good, and he is triumphant. And, and here's the thing, church. We just need to tie into that. We don't have to create that. It's already there. We're, we're not smart enough to do that anyway. All we have to do is just... Uh, Open up ourselves to what God so chooses and wants to do and let God be God. And the church will be more triumphant than we can imagine. And there are times, y'all listen, there are times that, that we don't really feel that. But that doesn't change it whether you feel it or not. Our emotions are not fact. And there are days that our emotions are up here and we praise God. And there are days that our emotions are down here and we don't praise God. But he's worthy of our praise, period. He is a great and a mighty God. And the quicker that we can figure that out, the more blessed we will be in our heart today. And when I, when I began praying about this series on the church triumphant, I thought, let's just look at when the church began in the book of the Acts. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. But really, we could say it was the Acts of God with the Apostles and the new believers. Because they were learning, and they were growing, and God was doing a great and amazing and, and mighty things, and I'm grateful for that. So if you would, stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. I'm not going to cover all the Scripture. I'm not going to read all the Scripture that we're going to cover today. But I want us to, to see where it is that we're beginning from. In Acts chapter 4, we're going to look in verse 31. That's where we left off last week, after uh, Peter and John met back with the assembly there. And they prayed for boldness. I love that. They prayed for boldness. But in verse 31 it says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what I wanted this to glean from verse 31, is that one phrase. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. That's what they prayed for. That's what they needed. It, boldness is a belief in your life that overwhelms everything else. So if you have anxiety or if you have fear, if you have timidness, if you're shy, if you're not quite un understanding of everything, if you're not sure how things are going to turn out, when God takes over, boldness will be there. Great encouragement for others will occur. Verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, I, I, I really know that 
when Luke wrote the book of Acts of the Apostles, and when he came to this phrase, he probably wished there was a greater word that could speak of the anointing of God, the, the, the ramifications of what it meant to be the Almighty. But he used these words, and they're good, but it almost sounds like they, they could be a little bit more, and with great power, we could say awesome power, unbelievable, overwhelming power. The apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, or Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's pray. Now, Father, I pray that you will take these verses and the verses to follow. And Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you are the living word. So, Jesus, we ask you to come alive in, in the preached word today. Speak directly to our minds and our thoughts, our thinking, uh, the, the genesis of, of where we are and where we want to be. And Lord, speak to our hearts, our emotions, and our will. And I pray that every heart, every soul will be given uniquely to you today. Father, we need more of you and less of us. And Father, we trust the words that you give us, for we know that they are life-giving words, blessed words, joyful words. So Father, may we uh, hear from you directly to our hearts. Speak to us personally. And Holy Spirit, be welcomed in this place today. Father, we pray for the freedom that the Spirit could uh, work as only He can. And Father, when you call us to yourself, through Jesus Christ, the name that is above all names, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may our answer be yes. And Lord, I pray that it would be 100% yes. Father, do what only you can do, and sir, we'll give you all the honor and the glory of the praise. We'll hold nothing back for ourselves or for anyone else. All for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I am intrigued by verse 31. It says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That means that at this particular point in time in their life, they come to look at God, and they were saying, God, your will. God, your way. Lord, I'm just going to come the way that I am, empty that I am, broken that I am, needful that I am. And God, I'm just going to accept what it is that you have for me. And then when it says in verse 32, one heart, one soul. This is everyone. All of those new believers, the last chapter, we heard that the county got up to over 5,000. And, and yet, 5,000 different people, different personalities, different ages, different backgrounds, different sins. Yet when they come together, they become one in God through Christ with the blessing of the Holy Spirit. And this one thing was good for all. That means Eddie, Jordan, Andy, Johnny. I mean, we're all complete with what God does in us. I love these words. You hear, you hear me say it all the, time, all the time. Christ in me, the hope of glory. And the same Christ in me, if you have Christ, is the same Christ in you. And, and the same need that I have in my life to get me from where I am to where I need to be is the same Christ that can be in your life to get you from where you are to where you need to be. All the way home to heaven one day. Through all the trials and the tribulations and the hardships of life. Get this, the church had something bigger than they were individually. They came and, and belonged to something that was greater than themselves. And they freely gave themselves to it. I'm going to use the word here that we use a lot that I think that's really misunderstood. Family. We're family. I mean, we may be the in-laws and the outlaws, but we're the family. Amen? 
And there's no big shots and little shots in God's family. We all have the same father. We're born with the same blood. We all have the same spirit leading us and guiding us. The same grace that comes and pours itself on me is the same grace that will pour itself on you. When I read the Word of God and that voice comes to me and speaks to me from the Word, that's the same voice that speaks to you. I don't get any more. But praise God, I don't get any less. I get everything that I need, and we have all that we need. We are together. We are one. The same goal. Great energy that becomes great synergy. I, I, I'm grateful that we live for a cause that's bigger than ourselves. And, and in the church, we give unto God, but it's really not seen as a sacrifice at all. When we get to this, we understand that, that they, uh, look in verse 32. It said, um, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. They had all things in common, verse 34, nor was there uh, Any one among them who lacked, for all who had possessors of land or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Y'all look up here. Please hear this. This is not some kind of Christian communism where we're all just the same and, and, and we just take everything and, and it becomes one and we give it out. No, it, the difference between us and communism is that was done by force. And this is done by the will of God. Nobody told them they had to do this other than their heart. They desired to do this. There's a story in the Old Testament where they were going to rebuild the temple. And the king was Joash. And they were taking the money and giving it to the priest. And it was the priest's job to repair and build the temple. But they didn't take it. They didn't use it for that. Have y'all ever heard of a, a hierarchy that would take it and spend it on something they weren't supposed to? Does that not sound like Washington, D.C.? That's as big of a commentary as I'm going to go down that road. Y'all just don't get me fired up. So Josiah said, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Nothing's being done. So he went to the priest and said, y'all have blown it. And, and I don't want you taking any more money. But he put a chest in front of the people and he let them come and give to that, and here's the key word, as they desired in their heart. And what gets me about this is they had to go back and say, y'all got to quit. We have got too much money. Where's Ricky Davis? Are you looking forward to that day at New Holland Baptist Church? Y'all quit giving over in abundance. It's not today, by the way. But here's the key. Give as you feel led in your heart. The same Holy Spirit that's in me that, that gives me the impulse and the desire, we just want you to follow that. And that's what they were doing. They, they lived a goal that was bigger than them. Yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. I love those words. Yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. And, and look what else it says there in, in the end of verse 33. Great grace was upon them all. The grace of God. Look, they're not doing this because they have to. They're not doing this so that they could get something back. Don't you? It's hilarious. Those people say, send me $10 and I'll pray over it and you'll get 100 back. I think the biblical word for that is stupid. <laughs> and, and I think the modern day word for that is Lottery. How's that working for you, too? I haven't paid the lot, played the lottery. I've been to Vegas one time. I didn't even put a nickel in a slot machine. Amen? I, 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 they're not getting my money. When I found out that my chances of winning the lottery were the same as my chances of being struck by lightning, I've been hit by lightning. I have. He hit about 50 feet from me, hit the ground, and knocked me off my ladder about eight feet in the other direction. I've had my shot. It ain't happening again. <laughs> Listen, but great grace, great grace, bountiful grace, overabundant grace. God up in heaven who has no debt, who is filled with the, 
with all the glories of the, of the treasure chest of glory is wanting to pour it out on his people. He wants his people to be absolutely overflowing with the things that last and matter. And if you're faithful in the little, he can make you faithful in the much. But it's not, he doesn't give it so it's about us. He gives it to put a smile on our face. But when we come to that place when, when, when we can use it for him, oh, how he can multiply it. The seed for the sower. And, and once the seed hits the ground, it, it produces a crop. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. But I give him glory for all of it. You see, because I know I have a God who wants to overflow in my life goodness and blessing. And I am the most blessed person I know. Of all, and I know so many people. I've got so many friends and acquaintances, but I have never met anybody that has been blessed by God in any way, shape, form, or fashion anywhere close as much as he has me. I don't deserve it, but for some strange reason, God just looks down and says, let's just pour out some more blessings on him. Let's just throw some more blessings on him. And I want you to know, you can't count that in dollars and cents because I don't have much sense. But I have so very, very much. And if you were honest, you would say the same thing. And when God's people would come together, one heart, one accord, and say, Lord, oh, I need you. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. You think God's going to hear that prayer and answer? He's going to do amazing and mighty things. Great grace was there. It was a new, it was a new day. It was a, a new challenge. It was a, a great life. I have a pastor friend of mine. He has this phrase he says all the time. It's a better way. Serving Jesus, it's a better way. You can follow what this world has to offer, but I'm here to tell you, there's a better way. It's a good, glorious, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful way. Some of y'all putting your little toe in trying to test the waters. I'm here to tell you, dive on in. It sure is good. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. He'll direct you from where you are to where you need to be. Oh, what a God we have. But then we get to chapter 5, and look at the very first word in chapter 5. But. All the things that we saw in chapter 3 and chapter 4 were there. Great grace was there. But. That tells you there's something else. Well, let's see what it was. Y'all ready? Chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sowed a possession. He kept back part of it, part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sowed, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When we got to the end of chapter 4, we find that there were people that were saying, you know, there, this is a great thing. This is, a, this is wonderful. This is glorious. I, I've got all this stuff. How many of y'all have stuff? I, I got this stuff, and we just need to get rid of it and, and give it because we want this to go. We want this to, to prosper. We want people who in need. We want their needs to be met. And there was this guy named Joseph who was given the nickname. I love the nickname. How many of y'all have nickname growing up? Stinky? One eye? I mean, usually the nicknames are not the most flattering, right? This guy's nickname was encourager the son of encouragement what a wonderful friend that gave him that nickname i mean when people saw this guy named barnabas that's what his name meant they said wow what an encourager this guy is well he just was a very rich man and he went and he uh, took all that he had and he sold it and, and he gave the proceeds and laid it at the apostles feet and said hey it's not mine anymore it's yours do with it whatever you wish well, that, that everybody heard. And, and others started to do the same thing. 
And there was this couple, and they said, you know, God's blessed us. Let's, let's do the same thing. And they went and sold their land, possessions. And evidently it was a lot. And they started thinking, you know, um, let, let's, let's give it a nice round figure. Uh, let's say it was $100,000. That's a lot of money. So let me give 80% of it. No, let, let me give 90% of it. And, and, but we don't have to give it all. We, we can keep 10%. And that's what they did. Now, hold on. I, did, I said this is not Christian communism. Nobody told them they had to do that. So they came and laid it at the apostles' feet. And, and pick up what Peter says about this in verse 3. He said, why has Satan filled your heart? Now, in the fourth chapter, in the 31st verse, we said that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And maybe Ananias and Sapphira were part of that being filled with the Holy Spirit at that time. We get down on them. Church, y'all listen to me. Don't get down on them. They were believers. They were believers. They were willing to give. They were doing a great thing here. But they lied about it. They said they gave it all, but they didn't give it all. And in verse 4, he says, while it remained, was it not your own? I mean, it was yours. You didn't have to do this. And by the way, after it was sold, it was yours. It was in your hands. You, could, you, you were in control of it. It, was, it belonged to you. But somewhere in there, you wanted both. You conceived in your heart to tell a lie to the Holy Spirit. You weren't lying to men. You were lying to God. And go on, let me, church, let me, let me give you the end so I can get to the heart of the message. I think it grieved Peter, and this wasn't Peter cursing him in any way, shape, form, or fashion. In verse 5, it says that, Ananias breathed, breathed his last breath, and he died. God took him. And then later, his wife comes in, and he asks her the question, "Is this, did you give it all? Yeah, we gave it all. This is the amount? Yeah. Why have you? And she died. The men have went out and buried Ananias, and they show up, and they have to go out, and they bury Sapphira too. People say, why in the Lord, why in the world did, did God kill them? Was it that big of a deal? It was a huge deal. Now, tr trust me, church, listen. This is the church triumphant. This is the beginning. And he wanted them to know right off the bat, we're not going to do this in two ways. We're going to do it one way. We're not going to set a precedent. We're not going to set a precedent. What was the precedent he was trying to get across? He wanted King Jesus to be Lord of all. And when they let Satan into their heart to allow a lie to be there, then we're starting to see that here's the precedence. You can be obedient and lie at the same time, that takes away being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's letting in, I want a little bit of God, and I want a little bit for myself. And they didn't want that to continue on. Satan knew if he got in a little bit, sin spreads like cancer. Here's where it breaks my heart, church. Is Jesus Lord of all? 
Are there areas in our life where we say, you can be Lord and Master and King over this, and there's other areas of my life, I can tell you're getting uncomfortable. I can feel a room. Are there other areas in your life that you really are not too fired up about him being Lord, Master, and King of all? Are there certain things that you're in control over? And that I'll give you these areas of my life, Lord. You, you can have those. But these other areas. By the way, I said at the very beginning, I want the Lord to speak. And if you think we're talking about money here today, you're wrong. Absolutely, completely, and totally wrong. I, I could care less. My dad owns it all. He can meet every need. He's taken care of me for 57 years. He can take care of me to the day he calls my name home. We're not talking about something as insignificant as money. We're talking about something of great significance, your heart. And Satan will allow God to have a part of your life as long as you let him have a part of your life. He'll let you control this as long as you don't give God all of it. How many people in this room make every decision, every decision, on whether it's good and right and honors him. Sometimes, yes. Amen? Sometimes, well, I don't know. That three-letter word that begins chapter 5. But, all of these things that God wants for our life, it, he is pouring out his grace, but then here's the question. Is he Lord of all? I've heard it said, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Have y'all ever heard that? But here's what I want to say. We, we're really willing for him to be Lord of this as long as we're Lord of this. And we've accepted that. For years, I, I, I grew up here in the South, and I've been in churches, and, and we would have revivals every year. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? And it's like, we're going to wait until revival time, and then people will get saved. People should get saved every week. Well, I, I know that I'm not doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing, but uh, at least I'm doing this. Where did we find some place in here where it says that you have a right to pick and choose your obedience? And you're not standing in front of me. You will not answer to me, but you will answer to him. And if you don't think this is a very, very serious thing, look at the words Satan filled your heart. That's what it says. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? I want to know, how many of you here today have told God you would do such and such, but you haven't? Lord, I promise I will. But, Lord, I know I'm supposed to, but we've been talking about telling others about Jesus and sharing the name of Jesus and have a testimony. Let me just ask you, how many of you did that this week? Somewhere in our lives, we have come to the place where we have said it's okay. It's okay to have a little bit of God and a little bit of this. And you're not lying to me. You're not lying to man. But there's someone who's talking to hearts, and that's the one you've got to answer to. I remember what it was like when God came and spoke to me. Listen to me. Please hear. I'm not preaching down to you. I'm in this. I know that there are areas in my life that I need to yield 100% that I'm fighting over, and I'm striving over, and I want to yield. And I'm praying about, but I'm here to tell you, I'm working on this, and, and I'm repenting often. I want God to have it all. You know what scares me about this? 
is that this will be nothing but another message. How many, time, how many sermons have y'all heard? And, and when we're in this building, we say, you know, right, that, that's right. Preacher Brian, that, he brought the word today. That's, that's Acts 4, Acts 5. I mean, we, we read it right there. The Lord made such a big deal about this that, that he, 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 he allowed these people to die. In verse 11, it says, So great fear came upon all the church and all who heard these things. He wanted people to, to walk around in awesome respect for truth. But my fear is that we'll say, you know, that, what he said was right. Now we're going to leave and we're going to go home and do what we've always done. That's my fear. Oh, we, but we want a great revival. And, and, and then we'll give it all to the Lord. Well, we have opportunity for a great revival today. I'm going to tell you this story. And I'm going to hush. And we're going to let God give the invitation. There is a, a school, a Methodist school in Kentucky, Asbury college and in the 60s there was a group of students that were there that were praying that God would have full control in their life and they they began to to give themselves to prayer that God would pour it out in their heart and their life and as a certain day began to approach y'all listening they began to feel something and they were praying all night. And one day they woke up and said, today's the day. Today's the day. Today's the day. And they went to chapel, normally scheduled chapel. And one of the teachers was there to give the, the chapel sermon. And he got up and he told the church, he told all the students that were there, I'm not prepared. I didn't prepare anything. And then he said, things have been happening in my life. Many areas of my life I've grown cold. And in front of the entire student body, he began to confess sins. Not because he had to. There was no threat. But something happened. The people responded to that. And they began to pray with him and encourage him. And when it came time for chapel service to be over, chapel wasn't over. And chapel service went all day. And all night. And into the next day, and the next afternoon, and the next night, and the next day, and the next afternoon, and the next night. Literally 24 hours a day for seven days, the chapel service lasted. The president was out of town. They called him and said, hey, um, I got to tell you, there's something up. What happened? You know, he's, you know, you can just imagine what would be going on in the president's mind. He said, uh, it's chapel. Well, what about chapel? It's still going. What do you mean it's still going? They hadn't left. What do you mean they hadn't left? I'm telling you, they hadn't left. They're going and coming back and going, in, but they're singing and they're praising God, and they're confessing sin. Evidently, they put a microphone up there, and anybody could come up and just start confessing sin in front of everybody else. For seven days, nonstop, the president said, 
I got to see this. And he called it, and he started driving him. But he's, this is his testimony. He said, the closer he got to the campus, the more he could feel the Spirit of God. When he walked on the, the campus and started walking up to the, to the auditorium where the chapel services are held, he said it was overwhelmed. He walked in and sat in the back because he did not want to interrupt. He did not want to be a distraction. But all he could sense was the power of the Holy Spirit working among his people, the freedom of the Holy Spirit, the abandonment of the Holy Spirit among his people. Asbury College. Go home this afternoon and look it up. The news people showed up. And they came in with their cameras to film it. I have a copy of it. And they could not understand it. Could you imagine a, a news broadcaster today saying, we're here at this church, uh, the, this school, and this has been going on. And, and, and then they began to brag on all the things that God was doing. You see, when it's Christ, it's unmistakably Christ. When it's man... You can tell it's man. After the revival, they started to get calls from all over the country wanting students who were part of it to come and share their testimony. And this was their testimony. They'd walk into the building and not try to give some elaborate thing, just begin to share in very simple words, five or ten minutes, what had happened. And this was their experience. Everywhere they went, the same thing that happened at Asbury happened there. It was unmistakably God. Vance Havner said, We have become so subnormal that when we see something that's normal, we think it's abnormal. I wonder in our Christian life if we've gotten to the place where we have satisfied ourselves to something that's down here in obedience to God, that if we see somebody who's simply trying to be obedient to God, we think they're a freak. I just want to know. If this is first century Christianity, is that the kind of Christianity you want? Yield it to Him. By the way, you can't control it. He is not the author of confusion. For seven days, nobody felt like it was anything other than God honoring. Nobody likes to see the parade of the flesh. But we need to live our life that's controlled by Him. Have we lied and said that there are areas in our life that we've given over to the Lord that we haven't given over to the Lord? Are there things in our life that are, that, are, that are yielded to him and things in our life that are not yielded to him? The answer to that is yes. Obviously, the answer to that is yes. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And by the way, I'm not asking you to come and do anything. There's one person you have to follow. Who is that? Can you trust him? I know there are some people that God, every time they're in church, God brings something up, and they still haven't done it. Whatever it is God's got his finger on in your life, start there. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, thank you for the privilege of allowing me to be in this place. I love New Holland. I thank you for the privilege of being the pastor here at New Holland. I thank you for giving me the privilege of preaching your word. Father, I pray that I have not made more of your word or less of your word, but just let your word speak for itself. Father, you were with your people. You were pouring out great grace upon them. You're a God that can be trusted. You're a God that can be loved. We can trust you enough to yield all of our heart, soul, life, and strength unto you if we would. Father, there is no competition for you. There can be no comparison. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day when we stand in your presence in glory in heaven, 
we will know that one fact for sure. We are there because of the blood of Christ, the work of Christ, the salvation of what you've done in our life. But Lord, I pray that we not have a king of kings there, but not allow you to be the king of kings here. I pray, Lord, that you would do this in a way that is uniquely you, that we would understand that it is your voice and that we would follow you. And I pray that right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would speak to hearts plainly and cleanly, clearly. And whatever it is that you want to begin today, I pray that the answer is yes. Lord, I've seen the fidgeting already. I pray that I see the submission. Yielded unto you. Your will be done. Father, I need it in my life. And I dare say we need it all over this building today. I pray that when we do leave this building, we would be different than, than when it was when we came in. God, be patient, loving, and kind to us because we need that. But Jesus, be Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen.